Our next presentation will be given by Eric Rasmussen. And Eric, uh, he received his bachelor's degree from the University of Oklahoma, his master's from Texas Tech, and his PhD from Colorado State University. Uh, he right now works with as Sims as a senior research scientist and also as the Vortex project manager. Uh, he also won the Presidential Early Career Award for Scientist and Engineer. And really what he has got uh, most of his reputation in in the community is for a lot of field campaigns that he's been involved with. He was the field coordinator of the first of the Vortex projects in the 90s, uh, lead principal investigator for Vortex 2, and now he's heavily involved with Vortex Southeast. So he is the ideal person to tell us about uh, Sim's role in field projects. Thanks, Greg. Let's see. So, I was a little surprised at that introduction because I gave material to Greg very late and there was sort of a threat made that he would bring up the fact that I was called the dry line kid in some earlier popular literature. <laughs> thanks, Harold. But he, re he refrained, so thanks again. Um, so this is going to be another talk where I, I'm got, not going to be able to acknowledge everyone who's been at Sims and been involved in field work because there are so many, and for our earlier work, it really wasn't really very well documented who was out there, that we had a lot of undergrads and graduate students uh, in the field. Uh, something that doesn't get mentioned a lot is that we've had people at SIMS who have been instru uh, very uh, instrumental in developing instruments, uh, such as mobile Doppler radars, mobile mesonets, and that sort of thing, and their, their efforts don't get acknowledged as much as they should. People in SIMS who do the grant administration and take care of travel orders that change daily for 12 or 24 participants. Uh, so, and, and then we have people in SIMS that have been involved in science leadership in these field programs. So I'm going to give you a quick chronology of, um, of where we've been in the last 40 years. Yes, I was cool. And yes, I was a kid when there still was a dry line. Um, back in when SIMS started, this is how field work was done in terms of making storm observations. You would go to the Weather Service office, stand by the teletype machine, and as observations came in every hour, you'd plot them on, on a map figure out where you ought to be chasing storms and, and head there. There was no internet when SIMS began. Um, then if you needed observations, you ran a dryer hose in the side of your car window <laughs> to a, a hydrothermograph sitting in the back seat. And then you took those strip charts and figured out where you were for every event on the strip charts. And you plotted them on maps and figured out where the rear flank downdraft was and the gust prints and all of these things. So uh, it, was a, it was a different time. Uh, in 1978. In, in those 15 years that followed uh, the beginning of SIMS, a, a lot of the field work involved development of, of specific instruments to do specific tasks. There wasn't really any coordinated field observing. It was more like, let's go and see if we can find out what's going on in tornadoes in terms of wind and pressure. And so we go and take this instrument in the top center called TOTO, and we take it to the field and we yell, deploy, 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 and uh, <laughs> roll it off the back of a truck and make some observations. Uh, mobile ballooning was just starting during that time period. Uh, there had been, of course, uh, radiosons could be done from fixed sites, but from mobile sites, it, it just wasn't done. So that was invented and pioneered here in, uh, in Norman. Oh, I wanted to make one comment. That guy in the, the lower left picture with the phone in his hand, I just wanted to point out that Dom Burgess hasn't changed at all in 40 years except for the length of sideburns. <laughs> There were some larger multi-agency campaigns during that first 15 years. One was pre-storm, which was, again, a fixed network of instruments, surface sites, and balloons, uh, looking at uh, the mesoscale influences on, on storms. Uh, there was not much of a mobile component that I can recall in that experiment at all. Gulf Mex happened in 1988 to find out how the air gets modified over the Gulf of Mexico and how that influences the, you know, the thunderstorm evolution onshore. This one actually had a mobile component called aircraft, a C-130 and a P-3. And they had soundings out there on oil platforms, which is something I, I wish we could try again, because even in the last few years of Vortex Southeast, we're having a lot of trouble understanding that return flow of moisture off the Gulf. Uh, COPS 91, this is uh, during early 90s, there were actually uh, fixed site profilers that were operational uh, in, the, in the weather service. And some of these were in the central US. And their, their data was really uh, very helpful in understanding the environmental evolution leading to storms. 
So something really uh, big changed in, in the mid-1990s. Vortex 94 and 95 was our first attempt to do truly mobile observing. And the plan on the left is our design of where we would put instruments, cameras, balloons, the little anemometers, a mobile mesonet. Uh, there's a little turtle in there, which is a, a deployable uh, a turtle, um, a little triangular or a pyramidal shaped uh, device with pressure and temperature sensors that you put on the ground. That it's sort of like the device Tim Samaras uh, uh, pioneered a lot further. Um, but then another thing is on, on the right is we had mobile field coordination so we could actually track where every team was and make sure they were in the right spot to do their missions. It wasn't quite as sophisticated as you might guess from that image because what would happen is the FC, the field coordinator, would, would yell out to or get on the radio and talk to a team like the Probe 1 team and say, Probe 1 digits, and Probe 1 would reply with the, 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 uh, the uh, degrees and tenths of degree of their position, uh, lat and lawn, back over the radio, and the field coordinator would type those in on a keypad, and then their icon would move on the screen. So really cool, but pretty <laughs> primitive. <laughs> Mobile mesonets were invented for Vortex 94 and 95 and developed here in Norman at NSSL with SIM support. Uh, these were uh, sedans with, uh, mobile, with weather instruments on the top and steering columns that smoked and were, <laughs> and were recalled during the experiment, actually. The uh, airborne Doppler had been developed uh, in the, I believe in the late 80s or mid 80s, but uh, one of the, the new uh, things that happened around Vortex 94 and 95 was a tail radar on this aircraft that could look both forward and backwards at slightly different angles. So they could essentially do dual Doppler as they flew along. They wouldn't have to do one leg uh, in one direction and then do a perpendicular leg to measure the, uh, the airflow in the storm. First mobile Doppler radar, this is Dow 1, was uh, developed here in Norman with uh, support from NSSL and SIMS. And, uh, this uh, obviously took off. This concept took off then over the next few years with a number of multiple, a number of mobile Doppler radars being developed for mobile research. And there's the uh, uh, there's the NOAA P3 aircraft with the belly radar and tail radar. So all those things happened in Vortex 94, 95. Um, so the science we, we we did that was a hypothesis-driven experiment by design. Our hypotheses were, were great for leading us to make uh, important observations. They weren't really testable and refutable because we would have needed to see you know, dozens of storms to get a decent sample to test those hypotheses. And uh, we haven't seen dozens of good storms in, in 20 years since that experiment. But um, it was, the, the hypothesis drove the experiment well. It, didn't, it wasn't terribly successful uh, because when we got out, when we looked at the data afterwards, we found out that tornadic storms and non-tornadic supercells looked a lot alike, at least in the kind of data we were collecting. But you know that's important to know because then you that gives you information to design your next attack on the storms and collect data different than what you collected in the last experiment. MEPERS, uh, the MCS electrification and polarization radar study, the 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 ballooning to measure electric fields and charge in storms. Uh, was pioneered here in the 1980s. And um, with time, we started to develop these simple models of, of the charge regions in thunderstorms. These models got a little bit more complex as, as more observations came in. MEPERS kind of, things started changing then because we applied a, an airborne <laughs> uh, Doppler radar, a uh, dual Doppler radar, and also sound, uh, the electrification soundings, as well as for the first time, uh, polarization radar, if I remember right. I hope I don't have these confused. I might, I might be thinking of a later program, but uh, the point is that we went from this concept of a simple single sounding through a storm to measure charge to multiple soundings uh, in the context of, of airborne Doppler data to get a better understanding of how the charge evolves in the storm. A little anecdote is back in the 80s, uh, I was with a, uh, working with Dave Rust on one of the mobile platforms, and my job, uh, this was a great job to have for hours and hours on end, is every time I saw a lightning flash near the vehicle, I pressed a little button on the end of a wire, and it, and it made, a, uh, made a mark on their record to, so we knew that a lightning had occurred near the vehicle. I think that went on until one day I let that device drag on the pavement next to the van after I jumped in next to when the tornado happened, and uh, multiple little marks and then nothing. A similar electrification study then was, was steps which happened in the high plains. Uh, northwest Kansas is where it was centered uh, with three ground-based Doppler radars. 
and, instead of airborne radars and, and mobile ballooning and mobile mesa network. And this one uh, actually, instead of looking at MCS, the, the big convective systems, the squall lines, this one was looking at isolated storms, such as the supercell in the upper left, which was more of a classic storm, and the one in the lower left, which was a, a low precipitation or one of the uh, drier type storms that happened in that part of the country. Inter the International H2O Project, which uh, that pancake house was named after this, um, <laughs> happened in 2002. And the, the main uh, involvement from Norman was in convection initiation. We actually had nine mobile mesonets. Again, the, the platforms that were developed for the first vortex uh, became a part of, of IHOP in 2002. We had mobile soundings. There were air, aircraft from NCAR. Um, and uh, we had mobile Dopplers. I think I might have mentioned that. Something that's on this picture that didn't happen is that UAV flight in the middle, which would have been wonderful to document the character of a dry line right above the ground or, or a boundary that might initiate a storm. Uh, that was a, a great plan, but about uh, during the middle of the planning of this experiment, 9-11 happened, and the FAA said there will be no more uh, UAV flights in the US. And it has actually taken now almost, well, it's taken at least 15 years to even get primitive UAV sampling of these types of features going again because of that event. Telex, thunderstorm electrification and lightning. This is the one I was thinking of earlier. This one actually started involving a dual polarization radar as well as lightning mapping arrays uh, to understand how the electrification happens and how that's related to the lightning that occurs both at the ground and aloft as well as the uh, types of particles that are in the storm in terms of the raindrops, hailstones, snowflakes, the cloud droplets, all of these things, how all those things are tied together to develop uh, the electrification in the storms. So as you see, we, we moved from basically in the 1980s, a few instruments being deployed one at a time, just learning what these instruments do and how to deploy them, to now multiple instruments in mobile settings to get the bigger picture of what's going on in the atmosphere. Vortex 2, 2009 and 10, boy, this was a beast. Um, I don't, uh, my memories of this experiment aren't terribly fond, but uh, some of the new things we tried in this one, well, we had new science ideas that basically grew out of Vortex 1, but in this, in this case we had a lot, we had several more mobile Doppler radars of different, you know, different wavelengths, different bands, uh, different scanning strategies, uh, same mobile mesonet uh, type instruments, and a lot of mobile ballooning. And I think um, from Vortex 2, this is, of course, a multi-agency, multi-university, but with a, with a lot of SIMS involvement. Vortex 2, I think, uh, again, it was another experiment where we probably discovered more that we weren't observing quite right and quite, quite where we needed to observe to answer the questions we were asking. And so that's, again, that's important information, and that's, that's influencing the evolution of another experiment I'll talk about in just a second. This is kind of a cool thing that's been developed here, Norman, the Videosond Balloon-Borne Particle Imager. Uh, that's it on the right, uh, sitting on a laundry basket, so you get a sense of how big this thing is. It's basically like that. It's got a, a video camera in one end and a dark uh, mat and lights in the other end, and it takes continuous images of the particles in the storm as it ascends through them as far as it, as it will go, and then that imagery is recovered and analyzed uh, in software to find out how big the particles were, how many there were, and all of that sort of thing. Again, really important information in terms of uh, understanding the electrification of storms. The DC-3 experiment, Deep Convective Clouds and Chemistry, I'm not sure how much involvement we had here, but this one looked at how the atmospheric chemistry changes as air moves from the inflow of the storms near the ground up through the storms and then is ejected into the upper troposphere or even the lower part of the stratosphere. Uh, how, how do the chemical changes occur as the air moves through the storms? That was the emphasis here. MPEX, uh, the mesoscale predictability, predictability experiment. The idea here is in the morning we take a, an, a jet and drop a number of drop sons in an area where it looks like our forecast models may be sensitive to getting more and better observations. So that's these yellow wind flags out there over Colorado and New Mexico. And then so the forecast models are run, and then in the afternoon, uh, as storms are beginning to occur, there's several more surface sounding systems that try to measure the environment right around the storm and see if those observations are, are helpful in forecasting the evolution of the storm. Now, MPEX is, is going on, uh, ongoing uh, through the work of Mike Niglio and others here. Uh, to continue looking at the sensitivity of supercells to the environments in the near neighbor in, in their near neighborhood, and uh, that'll 
that'll flow into the Taurus program, program I'm going to talk about here in just a second. Planes elevated convection at night. This was a, I didn't get to participate in this, but uh, I'm not broken hearted about that <laughs> because um, sitting up all night with a radar or a balloon vehicle uh, waiting for storms to come and hammer me at three in the morning is just, well, but, but it's a big problem. Uh, we, we've always been decent at forecasting afternoon storms but, and evening storms, but these, these storms that form during the night uh, are a whole lot less predictable and the mechanisms for their initiation are, are less well understood. So that's what uh, Pecan gave us. My clock agrees with you, by the way. Uh, vortex Southeast. Uh, there's probably, many of you may not know about this experiment. This is a fairly large a large endeavor that uh, has been going on since 2015. I don't know why I said 16 there. Typo. Uh, so Vortex Southeast right now is, is uh, administering about 15 to 20 million dollars worth of research. And the, the problem in the Southeast is that the meteorology is much less well understood than the plains. Uh, the, the, the things that happen in the environment that, that help promote tornado genesis are not quite like what we've been watching, looking at in the plains for 20 years. But on top of that, there's all sorts of issues with uh, the way people perceive warnings, the way they receive them, the way they respond to them. So big, big uh, bunches of uh, social and behavioral issues as well as operational issues. So we're trying to look at all those things in Vortex Southeast. But there is a field campaign component, and the one that's going on right now we're calling Meso 1819. We have a special sounding network that's going to be activated and do six hourly soundings whenever it appears there will be severe weather in the southeast, uh, all the way from now until April. And then nested within that northern Alabama region will be in, uh, several more sounding systems, uh, three or four profilers and mobile Dopplers and, and so on. So we're going to try to see if we can improve. There's a, there's a real-time HER assimilation experiment going on with this. We're going to try to see if we can improve operational HER forecasts of, of the convection initiation, behavior, evolution, and structure in the southeast and the tornado potential through these special observations. Um, all right. Finally, uh, this is a court of, sort of a new portfolio brought to SIMS by uh, Greg McFarquhar when he took over the directorship. And this is uh, uh, studies of clouds and aerosols. Aerosols are the tiny little particles that cloud, part cloud droplets can form on and how those things interact. Uh, one of the experiments they're working on, Oracles, is taking place, uh, it took place in Namib Namibia in 2016, looking at how the aerosols generated by biomass burning in Western Africa actually influence the clouds and the behavior of the clouds there. So uh, these kinds of questions are very important for uh, climate change studies and understanding what the influences of, of man are versus what goes on, would go on naturally in the absence of, of, the, of man's uh, uh, effects. And uh, so if you have questions about these, this new uh, thrust, I think you should uh, get together with Greg. You probably have some interesting stories. Um, oh, lastly, back to supercells. You've seen the animations probably with this uh, little river of vorticity that happens in the storm. This is an area of spin, both horizontal and vertical. It starts in the rainy part of the storm moves toward the updraft, gets turned upward, and develops what will become tornadic rotation. We don't even know if that thing, that thing is there in real life. The models show it, but it's never been observed. Uh, we don't know how it gets there, so we're going to the field again in an experiment called Taurus with UAVs, mobile mesonets, mobile Dopplers, sounding balloons, and uh, try to understand that. So I want to make a little editorial comment now that Greg's approaching. No, you cannot have the microphone. Um, <laughs> So uh, something I've seen over my 40 years, I think probably first noticed in some of the more prominent researchers in this field, is that they tend to combine disciplines and approaches, for example, modeling, observing, uh, working with operational folks, social and behavioral science. Individuals have been combining that and been very successful. I think that's a nice paradigm for where field experiments are going to go in the future. Combinations of a number of disciplines working together, actually not just this sort of a hopscotch evolution thing where we have where models discover something, observers go check it out, modelers discover something, but actually everyone working together simultaneously to advance the knowledge. And then my final comment is that when I look around at SIM, there's a whole lot of really good field observing talent, even in this room, and so I hope that we'll continue to expand uh, our role in the area field campaigns going forward. <laughs>